Hi, Megan. So for anybody who doesn't know us, I'm Tim Broom with Half Hitch Tackle. This is Captain Mark Hoach with 38 Light Tackle. And tonight we hope we're going to be able to teach y'all a little bit about something about catching amberjacks. And we'll cover a little bit on groupers, being that that's going to be the next species open in... Um, September 1st. Yep. And we'll be doing blackfin tuna next month, so... Yes. Um, so that's why we're going to throw some grouper fishing in there tonight, because grouper fishing and jack fishing kind of goes a little bit hand in hand anyway. Um, so did everybody have fun for snapper season? Is everybody as tired as I am? <laughs> it, was a good for, it was a good snapper season this year. I'm, I'm real happy with it, and especially with the quality of fish here at the end of the season. The end of the season has this super moon really turned on a good bite of big snappers. So that was a nice little bonus for the end of the year. I'd say this year was the biggest average snapper I've seen. So in years past, I've caught, I mean, on a trip, what, 40, 50 little ones. But this year, maybe at the end of the day, instead of a limit that everybody wants, we've, we'd keep four or five 25 to 35 inch snappers instead. Just the biggest average fish that I've, I mean, probably the biggest two month stretch of big fish I've ever had. Yeah. So, real good snapper season this year. Um, you know, uh, just a couple other highlights before we really get started. Uh, there's been a really good Wahoo and uh, white marlin bite out around the 131 hole in the nipple. If anybody wants to go get in on some of that action, the uh, sailfish ought to be up on the beach here for the next couple months. Uh, that's a pretty much, kind of, it's very similar to the tarpon fishery we have. Um, very untouched fishery. Um, well, I don't it, know if I could, you could say tarpon's untouched anymore. This is true, it's getting more and more, but there was a time, you know, 10 years ago, tarpon fishing was completely untouched. And I think in 10 years, if people will go out there and fish for those inshore sailfish, we would have an inshore sailfish that would rival the tarpon fishery. Um, so that's a couple extra options that you got going on right now. Of course, trigger fish opened back up. Um, hopefully that'll be open through. I'm kind of guessing about mid-October is when it's closed. The last couple years, we've, uh, the last two or three years, we've, we've, it's closed somewhere around the 15th of October. So we'll get about half the month on trigger fish. So we should have those for two and a half months now. Uh, what else we need to cover before we really start? It's beautiful weather. I mean, the weather's been awesome to get out there. And we got to get somehow get people to quit posting pictures of manatees. Yeah. What about, <laughs> what about gonna... the whole rice whale thing that happened? Or, yeah, well, that or we the... got that going on. But what about the actual whale sharks? So, so the whale sharks are cool. Yeah. Um, that was due to a, we had a very cold upwater welling that came, an upwelling that came out of the loop current. And that's what actually pushed all the whale sharks in here. And I think that's maybe what pushed all the big snappers up in here also. Uh, but I know that's what pushed the whale sharks up in there. But if we can't slow people down on posting manatee pictures, we're gonna have a lot of no wake zones that nobody wants to have. So encourage your friends not to post those. Um, no, I, I guess I think that's it. All right, so have a great night, everybody. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> we're done. So some keys to grouper fishing and amberjack fishing. You know, learn to fish natural bottom. Make sure you have a heading sensor on your boat. Um, some sort of trolling motor or helm master system to help you hold the boat in place. Make sure you're fishing heavy enough, either ledge or jigs that you can fish vertical. And that you're, if you're fishing here, your line doesn't need to be over there. That's a big key is to be able to fish vertical. Um, the lighter you fish, the more bites you're gonna get. You will lose a few fish that way, but you'll get so many more bites. Um, you know, learning to chum, that's not as, that's more kind of over on the snapper side of our bottom fishing stuff. Um, having a variety of bait is tremendous. Um, 
and then learning how to either slow pitch or speed jig for especially on amber jacks. The group proficient will be more slow pitch jigging, amber jacks will take slow pitch or speed jig. Or top water or fly. Yeah. The top water I, I feel like is more of a spring thing, but this week, the past couple of days, it's been doable. Nice. It's been hard on the runt rod, but. Um, you know, on amber jacks, most of the time when we're, when we're snapper fishing, we can get away with a six foot leader, especially in this heat that we're going to have through what we're, you know, we're only going to have three weeks of amber jack fishing the way they set it up this year. I don't like what they did, but you know, the choice, they had two choice, two options. One was to open up Amber Jacks August 1st, open it up August 1st because there's so much more effort. We only get three weeks. If they would open it up in September, instead of opening it up in August, we probably would have got September and October because of less fishing effort. But unfortunately, we're gonna get what we get. But that doesn't mean you still can't catch them. Correct. They're, they're still on the option to catch and have fun with, but we just won't be able to keep them in those cool, in those nicer times. But fishing this 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 warmer time period, having your the more lively your bait is, the better you're going to do, and to have more action on your bait, having a longer leader, minimum of 10 feet and as much as 18 or 20 foot on your leaders. I know a lot of people don't like that because it's a little bit harder to deal with. You have to hand line the fish once you get them up close to the boat. But having that little bit longer leader, you will be surprised how many more bites you get. And I think much like, and I'm sure we'll get into all this stuff, but much like Amberjack prefer a fast moving jig, they like fast moving baits. And mm -hmm. when your bait can only move in a circle this big, I, I mean, even yesterday, the big fish that we caught yesterday, we could see them in the water and we were throwing options at them and they wouldn't eat. And then we threw in a bait on a flat line, just a circle hook on the end of my leader and pitched it out. That fish hit and started darting over here and then darted way back over here. And all of a sudden those fish were like, yeah, and started chasing it real fast. But I mean, that, that fish on the flat line just had, I mean, almost as much room as you guys. It was just swimming around and it got all those things fired up. Yeah. So that's the truth. You know, um, probably the number one you know, while cigar is, herring, threadfin herring, um, all work for um, amberjack fish, fishing, excuse me. Um, there is nothing better than a live hardtail. Um, there's one other bait that, that, that works really good. Um, if anybody wants to know what that one is, please come up here after the seminar and we'll tell you about that one. Um, you know, uh, live mullet is also another very good option for both amberjack and triggerfish if you're willing to go out and throw your cast net. Um, and the mullet anywhere from about a six inch mullet up to about a 12 inch mullet is fine. This week, and I'm sure we'll get into baits and you've got that slide through in here, right? Yeah. Um, this week, I went to a spot, I could see the AJs in the water. I threw out live cigar minnows, wouldn't touch them. I threw out a live hard uh, threadfin herring. They came up and looked at it, but didn't eat. I threw out a live regular herring. Every live herring I put out, they would eat. Yeah. And then when I ran out of those, I went back to threadfins, and I got maybe two bites out of five threadfins. Yeah. Um, but it was just funny to see how different it was based on regular herring versus threadfin versus cigar minnow for live baits, when you can see the fish in the water. And the hardtails, you know, while they are the premium bait, they get a little harder to catch late the year, you know, the, these warmer time periods through September and August and September, they'll start to get easier again in um, October. But taking some little bitty jigs, some little bitty straw rigs, like we troll for Spanish, and trolling around the jetties and around the edge of the pass, um, that's a that's a very effective way of getting some hard tails. Also, if you want to try to use just sabiki sabiki them up, go to larger the much larger sabiki rigs. Get you something with you know probably double or triple the size of hook that you would use for um, 
uh, cigar minas and herring and things, get you a, uh, one that has a much bigger profile for it. But trolling for hardtails is one of the easier ways to catch them a lot of times. Couple pictures of some hardtails. You know, you got or amberjacks. You got to kiss your fish, make them feel good. Uh, you know, of course, groupers coming up. Trigger fish is open now, so you got. You know, and don't forget. You know, jigging. A lot of people will tell you that jigging doesn't work for trigger fish. Not jigging true. Absolutely, one hundred percent works for trigger fish. Those things will eat anything. And a lot of times, if you catch them on a jig. You're catching legal trigger fish. The bigger ones. You know, the little ones typically don't do it as good. Um, learning to read the bottom. You know, if Alex and the county have done a phenomenal job of building us some wrecks. Um, some some are old enough to produce some of those ships that the county's put out in the last few years are definitely um, primed to start producing some amberjacks. Amberjacks really, they like, they like two types of areas. They like um, big steel structures, and then they like places where there's um, significant drops or uh, ledges or rocks. They like bigger structure areas. Um, but learning to learning to read the bottom is one of the key things, um, and even more so on the grouper side of things. And you know this learning to use the split screen function on your bottom machine. And I really should have had this side covered up. But if you ran over this section of bottom right here, this is in 210 feet of water. Most people. If they didn't have this one side on Zoom, would probably have driven by this. I, there's so many times I can pull in right behind somebody where they've been and fish right where they've been fishing and catch fish because they just they just drove past it. They didn't pay attention. You know, if on your bottom machine, you know, there's a couple things that you need to be aware of and be looking for. We need this hard bottom return, the red part. If I pulled up, and on this side we're in 210, and on this side we're looking at just the bottom 30 feet. Well, I have a few fish showing here, but on top of this hard bottom, there's all this little green and yellow fuzz. Well, that green and yellow fuzz tells us that that's live bottom. If it didn't have that live living coral on it, I wouldn't be as excited to fish there. If you've ever fished on a charter boat, in so many words, your charter captain is going to tell you what you're fishing on. If he says, drop the bait all the way to the bottom and come up 25 cranks. Well, he just told us he's fishing on, on structure of some kind, and he needs you to fish above the structure where the fish are hanging out. If he says, drop it to the bottom and come up two or three cranks, he just told us that he's fishing on natural bottom, and this is what he's looking at. And what he means by get my bite going is this is the exact same place 10 minutes later. We've started dropping down and the fish start to come out. On natural bottom, unlike on a wreck, on a wreck they're going to be up suspended above the wreck. On natural bottom there's coral heads and rocks and ledges and they're all kind of down underneath that. And as you start to fish, they start to come out. If you have four people fishing on your boat, I promise you, whether you're snapper fishing, grouper fishing, jack fishing, doesn't matter. If you've got four people fishing, get, give two of them chicken rigs and give two of them live bait rigs. Because they start dropping them chicken rigs in the water and things come alive. Well, like think about a boat like the American Spirit that it pulls up to a spot and drops 40 chicken rigs. I mean, how many? 40? Sometimes it got 80. It's like chum in the water. I mean, you just put 100 baits in the water right off the bat and things get excited. And I think fish, they're not, they're smarter than you think, but they're still fish. When, as soon as something eats a bait and he knows something's wrong, 
Well, the only thing he knows is he just ate something, so he tries to throw it back up. And then he chums up all the water. Anyway, as soon as you get the first one hooked, and then I think once you get the first one hooked, and this happens, and everything comes out and gets happy, then you find more bites. Yep. So, if you got four people on board, have two people fishing with chicken rigs, and plus, don't catch a bunch of mingos doing that. And they're almost always in season. And they're way better eating red snappers. Exactly. So I don't mind having the mingos at all, because um, I'd rather eat them anyway. Uh, so, you know, that's a that's a good little trick. That and mingos everybody might make good bait too. Yep, those mingos. So, mingos uh, and uh, ruby lips and rockfish all make great snapper or great amberjack and grouper baits. Put the you know, just have to make sure on the mingos. They do have to be legal size. You can't have eight inch live well, mingos in the live well. They gotta be 10 inches. So long as they're 10 inches, it's fine to have them in the live well. I've called the Marine Patrol almost once a year, every year, just to verify that, that there are no changes. Um, but you can have them in your live well so long as they're 10 inches. They do count against your, if you got mingos in the fish box and mingos in the live well, the ones in the live well, count against your Ag overall Ag aggregate limit. And just because I'm feeling in a good mood tonight, I always leave the place, this place, after seminar, and I'm like, why did I tell everybody that? But I'm in a good mood. So I one thing I have started doing a lot differently on these sonar, I leave my gain a little bit higher than this. Like this picture is so clear, you can see there's almost no noise or anything in here. I've started running a manual gain with a lot more noise on here. And you can call me a nerd and tell me it's like the matrix or whatever, but I can see my line going down or my jig going down. I can see more fish coming out of the bottom. You can see a lot more on your sonar with a little bit higher gain than just like the manual gain it comes with. Definitely. We probably. Yeah, even here, like to me, like that's clearly amberjack, but I bet there's a lot more on the screen than that with a little more gain yeah. and turning your surface noise off. Is that mine? No. No, no that can't be no, mine. No, that was on Josh's. And I can't, on his, you can turn the surface noise off. It will not stay off. I'll have to, I'll look at that. I'll play with it. It will not stay off. But, you know, I hear this all the time. There are no amberjacks on natural bottom. <laughs> There's no structure in that photo. <laughs> I mean, that's just pure fish. Um, and those are quality jacks right there. Yeah, look how big the marks are and how deep they are. We well, you know what day that was from. That, that day we, that 90-pounder. Yeah. I have, a, I have another picture from that day that shows the sonar. You know, this is one where you got some amberjack up above the wreck and then some snappers over here to the side. Another good mix here. This is one where the gain's a little bit higher up like you like it. Why is that one so crooked? Wow. This is another really good little area of grouper bottom right here. This is one where, you know, you were talking about having the gain yeah, turned up that, much that. higher so you can see some of Whoops. that. That's right. Don't look at that. all right. You know, unlike snapper, you're not really going to, you're not going to see individual groupers down there. They're typically hugged up to the bottom, but it's having all this bait and stuff right down here on the bottom and having some better returns in here that you can tell that this is going to be bottom that's going to produce groupers right here. You think that's snapper or, or jacks mixed in? It's probably snappers in that deeper water. The jacks, I think if they were jacks, they would be much higher up and much bigger returns. That's another area that just has, that has a little bit of everything. And you got bottom for groupers, you got snappers in it. You got some possible trigger fish. Just, and all these pictures are ones that we, me and Mark, have taken over the course of a year to 
trying to come up with some of these slides that we have quality stuff to show you. This is one that most people will probably look at and think, man, this is a great picture here. It is good. There are some snappers in this, but there's a lot of other stuff going on there too. You know, we got snappers, we got mingos, we got a bunch of rock fish and stuff at the bottom. That's one from earlier. That's just a repeat from earlier. This one here, I would probably drive off from this one. It, while there are a few snappers right in here, there is so much bait, you know, ruby lips, just other things right there, I probably would not fish that. There's actually too much going on there. Those snappers are probably so full you could fish there for hours and not hardly catch much. Agree, disagree? Yeah. Oh yeah. I think I took that picture too. That, so this is one that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Here's your here's your mingos down here. These right here, that's the that's your line. Yeah. So with the gain a little bit higher, you can actually see your in most of the time when people are fishing mingos or um, groupers or snappers, you're using a big lead. Most of the time you can see your bait go down. And I don't, it looks like a second drop happened here, but where these fish start coming back up like that, it's typically when they, somebody's reeling their bait back up and you'll see those fish react. So like yesterday on my boat, we had marks everywhere and I, I told the guy to drop a certain amount. Um, and by drop, I mean feed out line. And you can kind of watch the fish follow his bait down. And then as he started reeling it up, you could see him come back up. And I like fish up higher in the water column. Yeah, they may be in the bottom, but I mean, even like when you're standing on the boat and you look in the water, you can see what, I don't know what the visibility is now, it's pretty bad, but maybe 20 feet down. Yeah. Um, so you know that fish that lives in the bottom that's used to it, can probably see a lot more than you can. Um, they see it and they'll come up and get it. So a lot of times, even though the show's on the bottom, and like you said, most charter boats drop to the bottom and reel up, I have a tendency to start shallow and work my way down well there i think they're more concerned in numbers of fish Agreed. and so if you want numbers of fish i think it is better to go to the bottom and work your way up if you want co the better quality Bigger fish food. start as high up as you can and slowly work your way down because if a little guy likes this if he swims all the way up to the top likelihood is something's going to eat him um so the the smaller fish will stay closer to the bottom you will get more fish down there. Uh, the bite will come much slower way up in the water column, but the further up in the water column you are, the better quality fish you're gonna catch. And once you get into the little fish, I feel like it's hard to get out of the little fish. They're much more aggressive. Yeah. Way more aggressive. Oh, snapper, more snapper pitch. Go back, go back to, that's the kind of gain I like mine that looks that's not my boat though because of the surface noise and some of the other stuff but i like having a lot more noise on mine i think even on this you can see a lot more stuff going on with these and some that with your gain turned up too high you miss a lot of that but just try it you can always change it back if you don't like it yeah that was one that you look at and you think Boy, that's pretty, those are, that's very red on the fish. But I think that the majority of that, they're just densely packed ruby, ruby lips and stuff right there. I don't really think that's one that I would probably, I may try to group her fish there, but I don't, I may drive by, past that. That's just an ever loving pile of mingos and triggers right there. And you'll notice most of these pictures are on natural bottom. There is one over here we'll go back to. This is a good, um, when we talk about the snapper spawning on these full moons, you can barely see the coop in the picture. So these snappers are probably a good 600 feet off the coop when they're spawning. So that's the coop right there. And there's a few fish on it, but there's more fish over here off of it out here in open water spawning. And, the re and if anybody wants to know, the reason why they do that is if they're right on top of the wreck or the reef when they spawn, 
Well, there's all the little ruby lips and squirrel fish and everything. Well, they'll just eat up all the eggs. If they come off the wreck a ways and spawn, there's a much more likelihood that the uh, eggs will actually have time to hatch. And they spawn on the moons yeah. because of the bigger tides. Smarter than you think they are. They're not smarter than us, though. You know, I was telling you, this is a little bit older picture um, of some of the wrecks that the county has put out now. But over the last couple of years, you can go on the um, Fort Walton Destin website and get all the numbers to the new ships they put out. They've got almost probably 18 There's out there lot. now. There's a lot of them. And some, the, the ones that they put out this year, I wouldn't worry about fishing those. But any of these ones that have been out there for, you know, more than a year, all these, there's a likelihood that they'll be holding jacks this fall. Um, and you can get all those off right off, the, right off the county website. You know, earlier we mentioned, you know, having a trolling motor or helm master or something that can um, help you keep the boat on the wreck. You know, being able to, if, if you don't have a trolling motor or helm master or some system, someone's got to constantly be at the wheel. You know, because you need to be over the fish. You know, if you're halfway across this room from the wreck, that's way too far. And I, I personally don't like kicking my boat in reverse when I'm on a spot. So I know a lot of those big boats, and it's, I think it's different with outboards. And on, honestly, I think I've seen a difference with manufacturers and different size engines. Um, but I am pretty... You know, I'm pretty superstitious about a lot of stuff, but I, I have seen fish react differently in the water when I hit my boat in reverse. I don't know if it's something to do with the frequency of it or whatever, but I think in and out of gear, I'd rather go forward and make a circle and come back around and look for it than throwing my boat in reverse when I get to a spot, especially if I'm going to chum something up to the surface. It's huge with cobias and tarpons, but I think it's somewhat true for everything. Any fish that are up in the water column. That's why when you, you want to um, you know earlier I talked about you know some of the fish being on wrecks and reefs or you got the big ships that the county's put out there, but having either you know depending on which electronics you have, if you have Garmin, you want the new you want the new G3 uh, and not G3 anymore, but the Navionics, Navionics Plus. Plus. Um, that's the new one for Garmin. If you have Simrad, you'll need to have like Seymour or some somebody else's um, stuff because Garmin is very proprietary. But you know, let's, um, I know you told me not to do this, Matt. There's somebody sent there some taking screenshots on, on Facebook. Well, they ain't got there's no numbers showing. Oh, did I really? I brought the wrong iPad. You wanna do it on my phone? No, I'm not I won't I won't let him do that. Don't do it. Yeah, but I can't show it because I don't have what I need on here. Well, well you can't use my phone. So anyway. Uh, Sorry, Matt. I have to unplug it. <laughs> so the relief shading, when I was talking. <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> There are no numbers on there, see. <laughs> so you look at these numbers that are sitting on top of this ridge right here. Well, if I turn off relief shading and just go to a fishing chart, those numbers kind of coincide with the, with the contour lines, but they're not on the contour lines. They're in between them. That ridge lays in between two contour lines. But with relief shading, I could come down, this, this ridge is down there a long way, this is about 76 miles. But I could go fish that ridge and not have a single number.
because the fish may not necessarily be on those numbers I have marked, but they're going to be somewhere on that ridge. But I can start up here at the top and oh. I can see my boat right there and just work my way down that ridge. Um, so for something that cost um, the uh, new Navionics Plus chip is uh, $249 and then it's a $125 a year subscription. But, well, but that subscription isn't, it's the subscription's only for updates. So correct. once you have the chart and you've downloaded the data, you don't have to update it ever if you want. You'll always have what you've already downloaded. Right. The subscription's only for daily updates on the, on the chart. But you can find more fishing places than you can ever use just by having it. Because all the ridges, all the rocks, and that's what you need to be able to go find, you know, groupers and jacks and stuff. And you're looking for those roll downs and big ridges where you have a backside to it that falls off 10 to 30 feet. Um, it Plus, hasn't... Sorry, and like, like we've talked about before, there's a fun part about finding spots and then naming the spot and going back and fishing it again. I think marking someone on radar and stealing someone else's spot, I mean, yeah, you'll catch fish, but it takes the fun away from it. So finding something yeah. new and naming it and having fun on it is part of the fun, I think. Well, the last three trips I've been on, I had my fish by the end of the day, you know, by 11 o'clock or so, I had my fish. Well, I spent the last two hours of my trip just poking around. I was kind of in an area, so I just started looking around that area looking for stuff that I'm going to catch groupers on next month. And Justin, I spent an hour, hour and a half each day and probably marked at least 20 places. And of the 20 I marked, I think probably 50, at least 15 of them will pan out to be good grouper places when it opens next month. And especially with snapper, I mean, you go to a spot, you catch two or three, great, you got them, move. You don't need to catch nine of them off the same spot. At my dock, where I launched from the last couple of weeks, a lot of guys have been complaining that they haven't been able to catch fish off of their spots. Whereas like the first month of snapper season, there were two of them fishing the same spot every single day, taking all the fish. And I have seen a huge impact on spots from guys overfishing it. Yeah, if you, that, if you ever take 80% of the fish off a place, the likelihood of them repopulating that place next year is very, very slim. You should never take more than 60% of the fish off a place. And I'm not talking about 60% in a day. I'm talking about 60% over the course of snapper season. If you want those to be viable spots year after year after year after year. Were you gonna say something? Don't tell everybody all the secrets. <laughs> he he was just saying you could do it at home on your phone. I haven't ever heard it, but I have never found a place where I can catch more than about two or three lane snappers. I agree. No, it's but, gonna, it'll become a trigger fish and mingo spot if you take too many snappers off. But what I have noticed last year, I had a spot covered in red snapper. And this year, I, opening week, I was like, well, I haven't been over here, but it's pretty much a guaranteed red snapper spot. And I caught two lionfish off of it. And I called Tim and I was like, hey, so and so's, I, I caught two lionfish on bait. And he goes, well, I'll delete that number. That one's done. <laughs> So. Even if they take them, even if they take the lionfish off, snapper won't come back. They are. It's great. You could take, you could go out there and take, hook a chain to it, and if it was still intact enough, drag it off somewhere. But they ain't coming back. They don't like that. Um, 
you know, amberjack are, amberjack and groupers both are brutal fish. And I meant to bring one of these, but I didn't. But we sell these at the shop. They're called Cheater Post. If you don't have one of these, I don't have one. If you don't have a couple of these in the boat, I can tell you, I fished my whole life. Y'all see me sit up here on my little stool. And this little stool is because of my back. And I got back injections yesterday, and I get back injections every three months. And I'm going to have this winter. I've been doing the injections for now for a couple of years, and they're getting to where they don't work as good anymore. And this year, I'm going to have to have S2, 3, and 4 fused. And had we had these 40 or 50 years ago, my back wouldn't be nearly in the shape that it is now. But this goes in the rod holder right here. I hope y'all can see this. But you just take your rod. Do you sell uh, I don't know if Navarre carries them or not. If they don't, we can always send some over there. If you live in Navarre and you want a couple, just go in the store there, tell them you want some cheater posts, then call us. We have a truck that goes back and forth a couple times a week. No problem. But these go in the rod holder. You just sit your rod there, and instead of trying to hold up like this and fight the fish, you just put downward pressure. Put the reel in low gear and just reel. And the top of it swivels, so if the fish, as the fish moves, you can, the, the, you can move the rod with the fish moving around the boat. And they are, and it's great for everybody. It's not just old people like me with a bad back. The lady was asking back here, it's great for ladies, it's great for kids. We also do have, um, and depending on the height of the gunnel height of your boat, we make what's called a children's one. If you have really high gunnels, or you have standard gunnels and you have women and kids, we have them in two sizes. There's the stand, we sell way more of the standards, but we do have a shorter version that's about four inches shorter. Really good for ladies, kids, or people that have extra high gunnels. I feel like had I met you many years ago, I would have had you on lighter tackle and saved your back a little bit. Maybe. These or are maybe easier not. to fish on. I, I really think these are easier to use. But now this is, if you are going to, I hate gut buckets, but now I love these little guys. We use those things a lot. If you don't have these on your boat, you're missing out, baby. Have these stuffed all around the boat. They go on the end of your rod. You know, most people are used to fighting, you know, if they're going to fight a, a, a fish of any kind of size. And I don't know where this got started, but you see them wearing a gut bucket. And they got the thing right here, and, they, and you have the rod right here. I'm telling you what, this is the easiest way to hurt your back because we are engaging these muscles. If you'll learn... Use one of these little guys and fish right here off your hip. You have much, much more power because now instead of using our back, we're using our thigh muscles, which are the biggest muscles in our body. And you got so much more power. If you're here, your arms are all extended. You got nothing. But if you're fighting from over here, we're more stable when it's rough. Plus, I don't have to grab that thing and reach around you and buckle it from behind <laughs> and do that whole thing. And on that, I mean, if you're, and it happens all the time, like especially on a spinning rod, if I'm fighting a fish for, and some of them, I mean, we've, I fought my, my second biggest amberjack ever, I fought for an hour and 15 minutes. And after a while, if it's wearing a hole through my shorts on this side, I'll, I'll put it on this side. I'll move around. Just change my position a little bit and hold on to it and gain on it when I can, but you can move it around as opposed to, I don't know, it's just a lot easier to fight. But we have those things shoved everywhere on my boat. Yeah, if you, you need six of these. Or slow pitch rods that have this nice cushion on the bottom of it and don't hurt as bad. You know, if you don't use de-hookers on your boat, there again, you're missing out. This is the handiest tool you're gonna have. It's a hand gaff. I, we were on the boat la, um, last year. We caught Mark gaffed a 90 pound jack with one of these. I was like, somebody give me a gaff. And they were like, huh? Like, well, give me a gaff. They were like, what? Well, and I just turned around. I was like, it's my only option. I wrapped the leader around my arm 
and just gapped it. And I was like, oh, no. I just tried to, I just walked backwards and it flopped on the deck and we had our celebration and tried to hold it up and bent the hook. Well, the story about that was, the reason was the gaff was on the T-top and it was Velcroed on. And I tried to tell the guys that we were fishing with, you need to put all these sabiki rods away because this is dangerous. Well, sure enough, the gaff's here and they went to get the gaff and somehow there's a sabiki rod on this side and this side. Well, he's got, the gaff is here, and both sabiki rods are like this, and there's no way to get to the gaff because he's all hooked up in it. And this is a good friend of mine, but I'm like, Josh. There's got to be a picture of it somewhere on my phone. But, you know, it's a hand gaff. It's a D-hooker. It's the best picture holder. You know, you gaff, hook the fish under the bottom jaw, hold him up. It's the best thing for taking pictures. At the end of the day, most people's fish boxes in the floorboard. You can reach in, flip them all out. Um, it's just it's, it's a such good way a to humanely tool. dispatch a fish too. Mm -hmm. you see how I had to word that cleverly. It does. It does float. It it does float for a little bit. But you got to have a good bait de hooker. And if anybody, you know, one other thing that I see. Some of y'all got so much stuff on your boat. When I run a guide trip on somebody's boat, this is everything I need. This is, this is, this catch, if I can't catch it out of this little bag, we're probably not gonna catch it. That's what I take. I actually think my guide pack, I think I have it with me. Yep. A sabiki rig, a stinger rig, a chicken rig, a lead, GI jigs, slow pitch jigs, hooks, and three-way swivels. Yep. It's really me. It, I see somebody. I went fishing on somebody's boat. I mean, tell you, there was there was five tackle boxes this size. We, you know, they had more stuff. You couldn't walk around the deck. I don't like that. We need, we need to have what we need for today and don't carry too much extra stuff. So I don't yes. mean, uh, I'm, okay, I'm kind of <laughs> good, okay with that too, point. you know. Later in the seminar, he'll say something like, you can never have too much tackle. <laughs> I love how these things have turned into like picking on Tim. You know, I could drop this level nope, over toe. Nope. This point. No, it's fun. I like these things. Um, as far as bait, I'm sure, hopefully everybody knows all the different places, but from around the Destin Bridge, out around the jetties and the drop-offs to catch your live baits at. There are more threadfin herring right here than I've ever seen in my life. And they've, despite what I said earlier about that one day where they'd only hit regular herring, those threadfins have been fantastic AJ baits. Yeah. If you'll just come... Ease off the little lip right there, and as soon as it starts to drop down, just start watching your bottom machine. You're, you may have to drive around, but you'll find them. And finally, now that snapper's over, there's a lot less boats out. Yeah. The actual sea buoy? Pin, pinfish. Yeah. But typically, I mean, and what's funny about the bait, you'll pull out there and you'll look up, and there'll be 15 boats around the same school of bait. And then you're in your guts kind of like, oh, there they are. And you just start driving over there. But if you just take a second and look up, there's probably an acre of them over there. And then 30 more piles of them around that no one's touching. So everybody has a tendency to just kind of loop up around the one person, the first person that they see out there. There's, a, I mean, especially this week, there's just tons of bait all around the loop. I'm telling you, we were out there the other day. Captain Mark from the Fishing Factor was right beside me. We're, we're catching our thread fins right in there by the finger jetty, and there's a guy sitting there right beside us. And I'm surprised he just didn't get frustrated and drove off because we're sitting there stringing baits. I mean, I'm, we, we're getting four or five at a time. And he sat there right beside us for 30 minutes. He never, I don't know that he ever actually caught one. And the big difference was he had two smaller weights and he had crappy bait rigs. It, it pays to have good bait rigs. I don't work for the tackle shop, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't, but there's a significant difference in 
the catch rate of a cheaper one or a more expensive one, which sucks because I go through so many of them um, and I buy, buy five at a time or whatever. You know, well, buying five at a time is not buying a lot of bait rigs. No. I have guys that buy boxes of 100. I'll, I, I will untangle them. You know, for me, I love, I love it when the bait guys are there. You know, I figure if I go through six or seven bait rigs, that's $40 worth of bait rigs. Or I could pull up to the bait boat and get 40 I mean, I sell the bait rigs. And I'm going to make more money if y'all come and buy bait rigs. But boy, and you, you can't go without bait rigs. And for me, like here at the end of snapper season too, um, I know we're not talking about snappers, but my last three or four trips, I've done better on frozen cigar minutes than I have on live. Uh, there's been a much better bite, but I love being able to pull up to the bait boat and tell them I need two scoop, you know, I need forty dollars worth of bait or sixty dollars worth of bait. Um, they sell them in batches of twenty dollars, so it's twenty, forty, sixty, however many you want, and for twenty dollars you get thirty baits. Um, but I really like being able to buy bait for the bait guys. You know, rigs we touched on a little bit earlier, you know, 10 to 20 foot leaders for jacks. I don't even know what I got on here. This is about 10 foot lead. Yeah, that's about 10 foot. You know, problem is, you know, you got your lead on here. I can't see in here. You know, your lead gets to the boat. Here, Mark, pretend you're an amberjack. Pretend I'm an amberjack? And see, he's still, he's still way over there. You know, so that amberjack's, you know, 10, 12 feet away. So you're going to have to hand line that fish the last little bit. Um, but having that longer leader will make a tremendous difference. And I'm, um, I am, I know Mark is, big proponent of the snap leads over the egg leads. If we were fishing on the bottom, and we were flounder fishing, you probably want a true egg lead. But very, very seldom should your lead ever be on the bottom. So if it's not on the bottom, an egg lead is doing nothing. Well, with an egg lead, if I want to change the size of the lead, I got to cut the line, take the lead off, put a new lead on. I don't like doing that because I might fish in 60 feet of water, then 100 feet of water, then 200 feet. With the little snap lead, I can easily change the size at the end of the day or when we're going to run from one spot to the other. I have everybody undo their lead, put the lead in your pocket. We're going to go to the next place. Make sure you hook the hook on the foot of a guide, not through the ring. Pull the leader down. Couple wraps around the reel. Feel that tight. Uh, Mike. Mike. Oh. Yeah, and I, and I do the same on my spinning gear. I, I don't fish as much heavy tackle, but again, same thing, three-way swivel. This leader is a little bit shorter, but now I don't have a lead swinging around in a rod holder. Yeah, if your lead's on here, it's constantly banging your rod. It'll tear up your rod, it'll tear up your guide. If you have it down at the base of your reel, it bangs on the reel. It knocks off the finish. Then your reel starts to corrode really bad. Being able to change the lead out makes a tremendous amount of difference. And especially, I, mean, I know he just said it, but I mean, I like to go fast on my boat. Okay, I'll go as fast as I can comfortably. And if I've got an eight ounce lead on a rod somewhere, no, I don't, I don't like that very much. Yeah. Yeah, I don't need, I don't have many many leads that big on my boat anyway. 
you know, as far as rigs go, you know, sniper rig, six foot, 60 pound test. Uh, grouper rig, I normally use around 12 foot of 100 pound, and then amberjack rigs um, up to 20 foot, and I normally make my amberjack rigs out of 80. As far as hook size, there's no, it's really hard to say use a 9 knot, use a 10 knot, use a 7 knot. Your hook needs to be appropriately sized for your bait. As your bait gets bigger, your hook size needs to get bigger. But, you know, for Amber Jackson Grouper, a good rule of thumb to start with is probably about the size of a silver dollar. You know, and depending on brands, that could be a 7 knot, could be a 11 knot. But about the physical size of a silver dollar is a good starting point on a Grouper Amber Jack hook. Yes. He is right. I always start with mono. And if I if we have fish on TV and I don't feel like I'm getting quality bites, I'll go to fluorocarbon. If you have deep pockets and money doesn't matter, I can just start with fluorocarbon. And you know, in that one photo I said you know, snappers 60 pound, groupers 100, amberjack 80. That's kind of your starting point on the high side. And there's a lot of days during snapper season is, you know, early in the snapper season, 60 pound, let her rip, you'll catch all you need. As we get later into the season, you know, I have, looking at the size of fish you caught this last week, I couldn't believe you were fishing, definitely not more than 40 pound liter, and maybe you were fishing 30. And all fluoro. Yeah. But my AJs all this week were on my snapper setups. I. I don't want to say I was lazy, but we were snapper fishing and I was driving right over a good one. And we probably caught this week, maybe 30 amberjack. Um, and all of them came off of uh, maybe what, seven, six feet of 60 pound mono. And that, you know, when the fishing, when it first opens, opening week of jack season, it probably doesn't really matter. Yeah, when they're not in season, they're really easy to catch. I'm sorry, go ahead. Whichever way the current is going, if the current's going that way, throw your live bait up that way so your live bait is down current and it's all stretched out and let it go down from here. And don't race it to the bottom. You gotta just ease it to the bottom. You know, if you, with that big old long leader, if you just drop the bait straight in the water and let it go as fast as you want to go, when it gets to the bottom, that 12 foot leader is about three inches long because it's all the way wrapped up. If you have braid and you don't have a top shot of mono on the braid, it will still be twisted up even if you do it correctly. Part of that top shot of mono is to give it some stiffness so it doesn't wrap. If you, if you go braid to your three-way swivel to your leader, you will have a ton of twist. I, I think a three-way swivel helps keep it from twisting a lot more than an egg sinker. I, the boats that I've fished on, uh, egg sinkers twist a lot more than three-way swivel. Just kind of helps keep everything apart. But right. I've fished a big top shot on AJ's now. You talked me into that. All right. No, oh, yeah, jigging. this is this, jigging's easy and way more fun than everything Tim just talked about. Yeah, you basically just get to the spot and drop a jig down and work it fast, and you'll hook an amberjack. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'll let Mark talk about jigging, then I'll start talk, then I'll talk about down downrigger fishing. I I fish, gr I mean, for grouper and amberjack, I fish different jigs and I fish a little differently. I fish faster for amberjack and Elmaco. Um, Base, basically based on what I see on the sonar. So if I see fish, and I, there's a perfect picture I have, I don't know if I sent it to you, from, I think it was with that day with Josh, uh, or one of the days on my boat, where we were in a little bit deeper water. Um, you'll see the amberjack on the sonar, like what, 100 feet off the bottom some of the times, and in the near shore of the state water stuff, they're close enough for me that if they're that high enough off of a high relief 
steel structure or something, I'll try to get them up on the surface and catch them on top water or flies or something fun. Um, but if it's super deep and you see them up in the water column, I'll try to drop a different shape jig, something a little faster, and I'll work it a lot faster in the water column. And a lot of times, yeah, there's all kinds of... It, the fun part about jigging to me is that there's really no wrong way to do it. Well, I say that, but there's probably a wrong. You could probably do it real wrong. Um, but, I mean, sometimes they've hit it in a rod holder just rocking with the boat. So a real slow pitch, really. I mean, just kind of going up and down in the current. Some t but especially for AJs, the thing I like to do, I'll drop it past them and I'll just rip it back up through everything. And typically that's been, in Destin, my best success on a more streamlined jig working a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think this one, like the jig that Mark has on, I think is a much better amberjack jig. And I think something with a larger profile that I can work much slower, um, right close to, if not off the bottom. This is something that I'll catch a lot more groupers, whether it's gag groupers or scamps or red groupers, anything like that. Some, something with a wider profile that I can work much slower and catch more groupers with. And I've caught more scamp off of a certain jig than I've ever caught off of bait. And maybe that's just because I jig more often than I use live bait, but I have one jig in particular that it's pretty much, I call it my scamp killer. It's the same jig I talk about every other seminar, that white Shimano Monarch. Um, but it just seems like it just makes that scamp mad. Like if it gets close to it and sees it, that's my scamp jig. But I, I, I kind of bounce it faster, and sometimes it's more reeling, sometimes it's more pitching. Um, but really, I mean, once you figure it out, but, and like I said, the best part about jigging is there's no wrong way to do it. So just play with it. Sometimes it's big flutters on the way down. Sometimes they're shooting past it. Sometimes it's ripping it up. Sometimes it's the jerks that really get them going. Um, but every day is a little bit different, and, and I think sometimes you find that bite when they want to hit it, they're going to hit it if it's just, if they see it. Um, and the thing with, you know, if you're fishing a live bait, it's one jack at a time. A lot of times if you're fishing a jig, it could be two jacks at a time. Yeah. I mean, you'll get, when they get in their aggressive mode, it is not uncommon to have one on each jig. You'll, you'll be jigging it and you'll get one and you get another one on there and you think you got shark, you just got sharked and actually you didn't get sharked, you just got two jacks. Or if you have one on each treble hook on a big top water, mm -hmm. yeah, say goodbye to that $20 plug. <laughs> so, an the big thing, that, and then we've covered jigging a lot and the technique on fighting a fish and how to do it, especially on some of those bigger ones. I fight fish a lot different on my lighter stuff, um, even on the spinning gear, like nine out of 10 people will tell you you can't j slow pitch on a spinning rod. Well, I promise you can. I mean, I've caught a ton of fish on jigs, on spinning gear, and I mean, I've probably caught more than some of the people who say you can't do it. Um, but it's just a different technique. I mean, you can't put that thing in a cheater post and lean into it and let the rod do all the work. The rods just don't have that much in them they're gonna give. So it's a lot more technique on it. I fight fish, totally atypical. And I, and, but we've talked about all that. And I think there's yeah. seminars on YouTube about us talking about how we do it. Um, it's fighting it off the reel and not off the rod. It is, but the reels aren't really designed to do that. So like a slow pitch, like the OSHA jigger, this one has a lot of power. It's designed to kind of do that. But we get a little more technical on these and we have a lot more of a linear fight sometimes, but we can talk about all that stuff. And if not, I mean, just come up and talk to me afterwards. I'll tell you exactly what I do. Yeah. And another very effective way of, when you're out there, especially if you're gonna go fish some natural bottom areas and look and scope out some amberjack places, downriggers can be very, very effective. If you don't have downriggers, but you have a couple bent butt um, trolling rods, a bent butt trolling rod can suffice as a downrigger. Um, just rig it up just like you would a downrigger. Um, and what the downrigger does, it allows you to fit, you know, on here you can see 
a lit, you know, a trolling lead, you know, depending on its size, about 10 or 15 feet. A planer might get you 20 feet. A lip fade will get you 30 feet. A downrigger, we're we're unlimited as to how deep we can fish. And so I think a like this one here, you know. I'm very impressed with this graphic that you made. <laughs> Look at you. Look at you. That's awesome. But you got your downrigger, you could just as easy be using a bent butt trolling rod right here with a you know six or eight pound downrigger ball. But being able to troll at 200 feet deep and trolling right above the bait where the jacks are hanging out. I think a lot of times when you troll for amber jacks, you get bigger, better quality fish, and you hook the fish up, he starts to come up, you keep trolling a little bit, you get him out of that zone, and then the sharks aren't nearly as bad. Um, because you're gonna fight, you know, it's not like catching a snapper, we're not gonna have him, you know, a snapper, we're gonna get in the boat in five minutes you know, even in super deep water. The jack's gonna be 20, 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour. The further we can get him away from all the rest of the jacks, the better chance we have of catching him before the sharks get him. And so trolling for amber jacks is very, very effective. And he doesn't have a chance to get back into his wreck. Right. Um, so super, super effective way. And like I say, I would rather have a downrigger the downrigger is nice because it has a nice little short boom on it. So when you have it sitting there, you can just reach out, grab it, rehook it, run it back down. If you're running on a bent butt rod, you're going to have to use a gaff to get the line, bring it back over, hook your rod up to it, and drop it down. Um, downrigger fishing, just super, super easy. Most people use a little clip down here at the downrigger ball. If I don't have to, I don't reel the downrigger ball up and down every time I hook a fish. I only do that when I absolutely have to. I run a snap swivel with a rubber band. I run the rubber band around my line and then have a snap and hook that to a snap swivel and just run it on and hook that onto the downrigger line and the force of you trolling to run it down to the ball. At the end of the day, I might have 20 snap swivels at my downrigger ball. I have nothing to contribute. I've never done that. <laughs> but we're going to do that on our fishing expedition. Yeah, that's, yeah, not my boat, but whoever's boat we're on. That'll be a fun trip. I'll bring these. Really? We're going to, I told Mark. I told Mark I signed him up today. Yeah. We might. Find, we might sign James up too. Yeah. Be a fun, fun trip. Get all the brains together. Try to get some pictures. Questions? Boy, everybody's an expert. Yes, sir. Uh, typically, I use 32s. If I have really big baits, I'll go to a 64. Yes, sir. Question was, how much of a mono top shot on top of your braid? 25 to 50 feet is, a, is plenty. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't need 100 yards. I really like about a 50-foot top shot because it gives me an idea of that much. You know, I can let it go down, and I know how, how deep somebody is by just how, how far the top shot went in the water. You know, I, I have them count Mississippis, but they don't always count Mississippi. You know, I'm one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, and some are Murph. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, no, but, so it doesn't, it doesn't, but having that top shot be about 50 feet, I kind of know how deep somebody is. And, and I used to use, just because I'd go through so much line, I used to use like just the regular Andy spools of, mon I mean, I just get like 60 or 80 pound spool of it, the little ones. And my, one of my favorite tricks ever is I'd put those in a koozie and just pull the li line out. The koozie makes like the best spool holder um pull the line out and just reel reel down a bunch but i mean even on this one this one's old and i think this one's actually fluorocarbon uh but you can see the line memory on it i've gone so far in the past as to boil water and soak my me line memory in it to try to to see if that works but it does 
but that's a whole lot of steps. Um, yeah, I mean, um, but uh, the bigger diameter spools, like those Andy monofilament ones, those are the ones that I really use the most. Need a cheater post for this. Yeah, better. Um, boil, boiling water and stretching really helps too. Don't do that. Just buy the good stuff. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, just a two hook bottom rig, like a chicken rig where you got a hook and a hook and a weight at the bottom to fish cut bait for um, mingos and triggers. And I think you, you and I do the same. So we talk about running uh, your main line or to your shock leader to your three-way swivel and over. On all of mine, I put one of these snap swivels on because if we get on a spot where there's a ton of mingos, I'm going to clip off this three-way and clip on a, a chicken rig and drop it right down. Or if there's kings around, I'll clip on a stinger or have something. So I use a ton of these barrel swivels or these uh, snap swivels too just to change everything out. So I can use the same rod for everything. Yes, sir. I feel like when you get a fish close to the boat and you get excited about it, everything, all of that goes out of the window. You're going to grab the, wrap the line around your arm. But no, you're right. I mean, there is a way to handle the fish when you get them close or when you gaff it. And, you know, safety is a big thing on, on the boat, you know, and trying to train your anglers up, you know, I can test everybody. I don't know if y'all all saw the post, but I had circle hook in the palm of my hand on just last week. Um, if you do not have, you know, everybody needs to have a quality first aid kit on your boat. If you do not have a pair of bolt cutters, go to Home Depot on the way home. You can buy a nice little pair of bolt cutters for about $18. But um, one of my buddies, his, um, his uncle, didn't mean to do it, but he's an electric reel. He's on one side of the boat. He's tangled up with us on this side. And he's a little bit older. He couldn't hear me very good. I'm trying to tell him to stop reeling because his, he didn't have a fish on, but he was tangled up with somebody who did and buried up a circle hook in the palm of my hand. You know. Wasn't a big deal, you know. It was there, it happened, it, it happens like that. Well, get a five gallon bucket, put some ice in the bucket, put some salt water in the bucket, put my hand in the bucket for about three or four minutes, it, just until I couldn't stand it anymore, just freezing. My hand just hurt. And it was in this fatty tissue. So my buddy, he had to put, I was trying to push the hook through he had to put pressure on the palm pad of my hand so it would hold the meat down and I could push it through, push the hook through, cut it off, slid it back out, you know. And his uncle was like, I guess we got to go in now. I was like, no, y'all need catch. I said, we got 10 snappers in the box. We need four more. Y'all catch four more snappers. I'm going to have a Diet Coke and a piece of fried chicken. Y'all catch us four more snappers and we'll go home. Um, you know. And you just want to make sure that when you get something like that, you know, you need to have a good first aid kit on the boat. You know, before you do anything, just sit there, keep pressing it and let it bleed. You want to make sure it bleeds. Try to get all that out. Afterwards, you know, have you some hydrogen peroxide on the boat. Clean it real good with the hydrogen peroxide. After the hydrogen peroxide, have you some triple antibiotic ornament. Get that on there. Wrap it up. Come to the house. But having the, having... You know, don't go buy just a cheap old little safety kit. It'll have Mickey Mouse Band-Aids in it. Go get you a nice waterproof bag. Go to Walmart or CVS and put all the quality stuff in there. Have zip stitch kits. You know, make you a nice first aid kit. And, and pray that you never have to use it. Those $18 bolt cutters. Man, it'd be nice if we get to go and never have to use those, but those just sure save your day, you know. And I, I keep them in a, I mean, most of you guys have a vacuum sealer for fish anyway. I vacuum seal my tools before I put them in the boat so they don't corrode. That's one of my bonus tips that I didn't want to give out. But having, having a proper first aid kit will 
will really save your day out there one day. Uh, back to your point, though, about handling those fish. On my boat, what I'll have the angler do, especially when that fish gets close, I like to have people stop reeling six feet or so from the rod tip. I mean, most people get super excited and ram the metal right into my rod tip, but I'll, I'll, I'll say, stop, stop, stop reeling. But when they get that close, if they can grab onto the weight, and a lot of times, I mean, th from that point on, that fish is mine, whether I gaff it, if I hand line it in, if I take care of it. But a lot of times, those fish aren't done yet. And for me, that's my call. And I'm pretty mean to the fish anyway. So if I get him wrapped up or if I get him close enough to a gaff, he's mine. And there's a good place to gaff the fish too. But you're right. I mean, it, once that thing gets close and he's excited, that's when hooks start swinging around and all that. But my big thing, once I grab onto the line, a lot of times I'll tell them, flip the bale open. Leave that bale open. If that fish takes off or whatever, I'd rather him not rip the rod out of your hand, not have the lead swim, swinging around anywhere. But if anything happens, you drop this and just, just put it in a rod holder and let him go. Um, but what about gaffing it? I like I gaff it in the peck fins if I can. Actually, I'll be honest, I try to gaff it in the mouth. I'm kind of, I like having good pictures of my fish. Uh, like if once he's close to the, especially out of deep water, they're pretty tired when you get them to the boat. Yeah, yeah. I do oh, too. for sure. For I'm, sure. I'm very yeah. well, you, you catch big. little fish anyway, I think. I saw the pictures of it, but uh, <laughs> when you catch a big one, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just, um, but another thing too, Tim, I don't know if you want to talk about this. Uh, so I don't know if everybody knows the difference on what a greater, a lesser, and a, or an Almaco look like. Do you have a graphic of that on your phone? I actually have it. I do have it on my phone. And if you read the FWC rules, they're pretty confusing. Ninety. Uh, uh, greater to lesser is a hundred percent, because we don't have lessers. Tim will tell you about his thoughts on amberines. Come on. I remember this fish was caught on a slow pitch jig too. That was on the white Shimano or the glow colored butterfly on a spinning rod. And so, we, so was this one. We have three types of jacks that we catch. We catch banded rudder fish. All the charter boats call those amberines. They're very bullet shaped. They're round, you know, an amberjack and an almaco are kind of thinner fish. A banded rudder fish, or what we call an amberine, they're little bullets. They're about as wide as they are tall. And they're real, they're real soft. The Almaco Jack, he's more of a pyramid shape. He's definitely, he's super, super easy to tell from what an amberjack is. And he's got this big fin too. Yeah. And then we have the true amberjacks. Um, but we do not catch lesser. If you think you have a lesser amberjack, you have an illegal amberjack. Because we, it's kind of like bright groupers. I've fished here 50 years. Man, I don't think I've seen two dozen black groupers. I'm sure there's been a lesser amberjack caught here. They have tails. But without counting gill rakers, getting internal of the fish, you're not going to know them apart. And even then, the gill rakers overlap in the regulations. Yeah. So they're like, it could be like 9 to 13, or the other one's like 8 to 12. And you're like, whoa, all right. Yeah. If, if it's not 34 inches, throw it back. <laughs> yeah. And the color of these, too. Yeah. They're real, they're much more silvery colored. And this picture doesn't do a good line. They do have a little yellow line that kind of runs almost the whole length of the fish.
If y'all don't get any more questions, we'll get Kayla up here and give away a bunch of free stuff. Yeah. Kayla, you want that, my mic? Return them right to the Also, guys, once once these are out of season, you can still catch them. And I think a lot of you are here from that for that descending device for that. Yeah, once once season's over, you can still catch these, and they're all, they're fun to catch. I mean, it's one of the most fun fish, especially on a rod. Well, fun for me to watch somebody catch them. I'll put it that way. Once you catch one, you've you've done it. Um, but the. Uh, Return them right, the guys for the descending device group. You guys know that's a law. You either have to have a descending device or a vent tool on the boat. Uh, but at one of the seminars, I think we gave away a bunch of descending devices. But the company itself, uh, you go online, you fill out the form, you fill it out. They'll send you, I think, two different descending devices, a lead, uh, three different devices, a lead. Um, and I think half-inch sells vent tools. Uh, but I did bring a couple extra koozies that have a sticker and the QR code to the website uh, if you want to grab one or, or scan the code so you can fill that out. But we get it in a couple of weeks. Nick's a pretty nice guy. Yeah, Nick's okay. <laughs> He's okay. He's decent. Yeah. All right. Now what you've all been waiting for. Let's go ahead. Um, I know if you guys have been here before, you've probably heard of uh, Calypso Marine Deck. They actually have donated three different sets here that are going to be mats for the top of your cooler and also a ruler. So we'll give away the first set. This will be our number one. And this is gonna go to... Keith Miller. All the way in the back. Congratulations, Keith. <laughs> You're welcome. Here, let me give you this just in case you have any questions on that. Thank you. All right, so next we will do, let's do a, a legendary marine towel and a legendary hat. And this is going to go to... Captain Mike Parker, come on down. <laughs> If you guys don't know, Captain Mark, Mike Parker here is over the Destin High School fishing class. He has created that for us, teaching all the young anglers how to be captains, right? Get into the fishing industry. So we love him for that. <laughs> All right, so the next prize, this one is actually one, I don't know if the guys talked to you um, about GI jigs or not. I know you guys have probably heard about that before if you've been here in the past, but we've got um, a koozie here and a couple of GI jigs. There's a small, they're the half ounce, but these are really great if you guys have been out and seen any mahi. These are the go-to for catching some mahi around here. So the first one is gonna go to Ron Porter. You want to be my Vanna now? You can draw some names for me. Thank you. All right, so let's go for the next Calypso Marine Deck package here. This is going to go to Myrna Groves. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Next up, let's do another legendary set here with a hat and towel. This is going to Michael Burton. <laughs> you guys in shop. Thank you. All right, the next GI jig set, and let's go ahead and put one of the Return Em Rot sets here too. This is going to Tracy Lilly. Is that right, Lily? 
We'll give it to you. I'm going to trust you, but if she comes back and says that you did <laughs> Thank you. All right, Tim. Let's do the next one. Uh, yes, here we go. The next one for Calypso Marine Decks. This is going to... Read the last one. Terrell... 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 Bray... All right, so how do you how do you pronounce your last name? Bro. Bro? Like, Bro. Bro. Okay, I like it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay, next for the, let's do another legendary set here. This is going to Val Callahan. Oh, yes. This is perfect. It matches you and everything. Let's do another GI Jigs. Keith the male. Keith, oh, look, there you go. Now you can catch all the mahi out there. <laughs> there you go. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, let's do, we have two, uh, one more of the uh, GI jigs here. And this is going to go to Charles D. Crescenzo. Is that right? Congratulations. Now, Tim. We have a little bit of a different situation now. We're going to stop drawing names here. Okay. This is going to be for you. I'm going to hand this back to you. Thank you. So we have two legendary hats here. Okay. These are the children's sizes. So if we can do two trivia questions and see which kids we have to answer correctly, we're going to give the hats. All right. I'm gonna ask maybe one of the species we've talked about tonight. You wanna think about that? Do you want mine? <laughs> we will also throw in the Return on Rot stickers too, or the Return on Rot um, coupon. All right. Kids only. How long did we say that your leader needed to be for Amberjacks? He had his, the yellow hat. You right there. You had your hand up first. There you go. So, what's your name? Weston. Congratulations, Weston. All right, number one bait for Amberjacks. Got it. Good job, guys. What's your name? Austin. Austin, congratulations, Austin. So guys, we still have some of these return them right. Um, if you guys have not gotten them into the past, the, yep. uh, the um, basically, you come in and put in the code and you can get them for free. And then I guess if you have any more questions for Tim. And um, next month's seminar will be um, on blackfin tuna fishing. And uh, so we hope to see everyone out for that. Thank you all for coming tonight.